Good evening and welcome to the Caring View, the online social care chat show, free for everybody, exclusive to YouTube. Before we get started, don't forget to uh, hit that subscribe button below this video, hit the bell, there is a bell, you'll get notified when we've got new videos, um, and everything that we discuss, all of our views and opinions tonight are of our own and not our respective companies. So, it feels like two seconds ago we were last on air, because we did Tuesday's last Friday, and then we've had the weekend, and I'm, I'm I'm all lost for me days. How are we both? What's new? <laughs> there it does. It feels like it's gone. If it, it feels like it's gone really quick, although it was just Friday, so it's a really yeah. Thing. Yeah. You know. How I'm, are you, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm good. It does feel like it's been a week, not in a bad way, but yeah, it, it just yeah, it's going to make the rest of the week feel really slow now, isn't it? I think, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't think there's anything new with me, just ticking along as always. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. There's a hot topic that we've been discussing. It's not even care-related, so, you know, for once, we're going to just touch upon something that's not care-related. Fruit and veg, do you eat the skin? Do you eat the skin? I definitely do. <laughs> Our Mark here, and I'm going to out you, Mark, and it's not to embarrass or anything like that. We'll eat the skin on a satsuma and eat the skin on a kiwi, and... I am I am shooketh. I am shooketh at this fact. I have to peel everything, and if there's any little bit more, I'm scraping it off. And you just fall and go in. You just go in. Yeah, I don't. Do you know what? Come I very on. rarely I very rarely cook veg, so I normally just get it straight out of the, out of the fridge, however it comes, and just eat it. So I very rarely peel it. And even if I steam the carrot, I don't ever peel it. Potatoes, I never peel. Yeah, kiwi, satsumas, oranges. The only thing I don't eat the skin of is a banana. It's too tough. But, yeah. <laughs> Have you tried it? I've tried it, yeah. But it is just too tough. Yeah, it's just not worth it. So, But most things, I don't I, think there's much that I don't peel. So. I can imagine you sat there with a the grapefruit just like munching on it quite joyously. <laughs> it's a bit like a, a man I don't eat the skin of a mango, but uh, if you buy an actual mango, it's definitely one of those fruits you have to eat in the shower, isn't it? Just because they go everywhere. I'm giving away all my secrets. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> so you're, just, you're just brushing your hair in the shower, giving it a good old wash, eating your mango. It's no different than people on, um, on social media with Chinese in the bath, as it's like floating around them. So I won't lie, I have tried what? it. <laughs> Is it too much to ask to sit at a dinner table nowadays with an knife and fork and a napkin put into your shirt? Yeah. <laughs> so, anything new in the care world that we need to discuss? Ooh, not that I can think of myself. No, Dawn, anything you can think of? No, the, the only thing that I've really seen is about the, how they feel the um, booster rollout has been pretty poor. Um. And it's been quite a low percentage of uptake. Um, having spoken to quite a few care managers and colleagues, the, the general consensus is that staff are kind of feeling if it isn't mandatory, they're not going to do it. Mm. So, you know, but so there has been a low uptake. And, and that's something I've been keeping an eye on in respect of whether they're going to deem it mandatory later on, because if there's going to be a low uptake in social care, are they then going to push it further? Um, but that's only the re that's really the only thing that I've seen, apart from our lovely friends at Rights for Residents who are still campaigning and are still working with families who aren't getting any type of visit or any kind of time with their relatives in care homes. So keep going to everybody at Rights for Residents. I did see in the John's campaign group that um, it's a health watch somewhere. Um, so I won't say which, I'm going to try and find it out, I won't say which health watch it is. They've done in collaboration with a number of other people, a myth-busting fact sheet, here we go. So it's Health Watch Leeds, Leeds City Council, Leeds Care Association, and Leeds Community Healthcare NHS Trust. And they've put together a myth-busting fact sheet for essential caregivers and key visitors. Um, and it goes on to, you know, bust the, the, the myth that it's too risky to allow people to come in. They'll take up too much staff time. Only residents who meet strict criteria can have essential care. Um, it's only for personal care. Uh, essential caregivers uh, visits need to stop if there's a COVID outbreak. So obviously all of those are false. 
um, and it's a, a, quite a good little uh, little uh, fact sheet. So we'll um, share it into um, the Care and View Facebook group. For those who aren't in the John's campaign, John's campaign group, you can go and join it. It's absolutely fine. It's a great support for people who are relatives of people living in care homes um, or in care in general. Um, but yes, we'll pop it in the um, Care and View Facebook page as well. Uh, just so that you can all see it. And if you are struggling to get that essential caregiver status, um, it may help you um, to go, wait a minute, I can come in. Yeah. So, yeah. I think I, think I also a... saw some... Sorry. No, go on. I was just going to say, it's such a shame that like, the rest of the world seems to have, or the rest of England seems to have opened up, but, yeah, there's so many care homes that still aren't doing any kind of visiting. I think, like, at the weekend when I went to a concert, there was no... You didn't have to show a passport, you didn't have to do any kind of tests, you know, you could just rock up. But yeah, there's still care homes that won't do any kind of even outside visits, which just, yeah, seems to show. You didn't do have to do a COVID status thing or anything at that concert, because you sent a video of that concert and I was like, oh, this is buzzing. Like, I want to be there. I know it's like teeny bop pop music, but, you know, I'm partial to a bit of teeny bop. Yeah, up my street. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolute nothing. I, I don't know how many people are there. I'll have a look um, in the background, but yeah, absolutely nothing, which did surprise me because I'd done a test myself, um, had my passport ready, but yeah, absolutely nothing. But I'll have a look. Um, so the only other thing that we've really got to update people on is our Halloween poem competition. Yeah. Come on, Abby. When does it run till? Does it run till Friday? Runs till Friday. We know you've done yours. <laughs> I ain't no William Wordsworth, but I'm going to make it all atmospheric. So just talk between yourselves for a second. That's very bright. Oh. Why, why we talk amongst ourselves while he grabs it? I do completely agree with the booster. I'm in quite a few of the um, care and support workers, and I've got a care and support worker WhatsApp group um, that I set up during the pandemic. And they're all talking about it on there. And I think the biggest thing is that some of them had their boost or had their second vaccine and they're saying why do i need a booster so yeah. soon after um obviously most other vaccines you don't have to have a booster so soon after i have no idea what adam's doing he's obviously got carried away for it, but... no, no also there's a lot of there's a lot of oh frustration i think because there, um care staff also being pushed into flu jabs as well i know when i went for my um when i went for my booster I had two nurses and I got given the flu jab at the same time. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of contention surrounding what jabs they need to have, when they need to have it, if it's mandatory. And yeah, I think it's just causing a low uptake. I think more information once again needs to be shared. Which yeah, no. And I'm, yeah, I'm not anti-vax. So sorry, just so you can see me. I'm not anti-vax, <laughs> but I, I do feel like we are running the risk of using this mandate and the vaccine to confuse people into thinking actually they need to get everything. And we're always about giving people enough, inter enough information to make a fully informed decision. And we need to do that with our teams as well. You know, we can't let them live in this ambiguous, you know, this ambigu ambiguous situation of do I need it? What do I need? When do I need it? Because even we don't know, you know? It's it's so difficult. It's so difficult. What one but thing get jabbed because it's good for you. One thing that's affecting Essex is the staff that have had the AstraZeneca as the first dose. There's nowhere local to get the second dose, so they're having to drive an hour and a half to get the second dose of AstraZeneca. So then staff wow. are saying, "You need. To, am I going to get paid? Am I going during work hours?" Which then just obviously adds extra pressure. And then I have seen on the um on the manager groups today slightly um, veering off with the PPE portal that is now leading them through to the actual eBay site to purchase the PPE. So for gloves and things, it's not actually free. Yeah. Um, which whether that's changing, I don't know. They've obviously got a consultation out at the moment, which makes me think that it will be not free anymore because they didn't do a consultation before. So the only reason I can think they've actually gone out is so they can say actually we're not, it's not needed. I thought they confirmed it was going to be free until March next year. Yeah, I think they've got other hopes. Adam, it just looks like you've got like a blackout power cut. So let's get to you. <laughs> so, poems, uh, 200 words. I must admit, I don't think I've counted the words in mine. Um, and the only reason I'm reading my poem out is I'm absolutely terrible at poems. And I just want to show everybody that anyone can write a poem. Um, and it's going to be a bit of fun. You know, we'll read them out on the show. We'll share them across our social media. Um, 
Mark's a bit of a, an eccentric, so he'll put on uh, a good performance reading out some of the poems. So will Dawn. So will I. And it's going to be quite hard fun. <laughs> yeah, and obviously, we'll be doing it next week on next week's show when we're talking about activities. I think we've got the wonderful Johnny Mac joining us um, next week when we do it, haven't we? So, without further ado, I am not a skeleton who can jangle my bones. I'm not a mummy that's wrapped up in groans. I'm not a ghost who will give you a fright. I'm not a werewolf who'll go for a bite. I'm not a vampire who'll drink your blood. I'm scarier than all of those that understood. So if you see me hiding under your bed, pull up those covers right over your head. Because I'll scare you like no others can. Do you know my name? I'm the boogeyman. <laughs> that was really good. I reckon you stole that from Google somewhere. No, that was really good. Yeah, King of Plagiarism over here. <laughs> I was a little bit worried about your beard catching on fire. So it was <laughs> I was getting a little bit intoxicated by the gingerbread fumes from your candle. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, send us an email to you, thecaringview at gmail.com. Um, we want to hear from everybody, care homes, home care providers, day centre services, learning disability homes. If you are providing some form of support to people, we want to hear your poems. Let's have a bit of fun. Let's spread a bit of joy before we head and, uh, go into these winter months. So, Mark, I'm out of breath now because candle and poem and dramatics. Do you want to lead us into tonight? Yes, so tonight we have two amazing guests from Cohesion. They're here to talk to us about recruitment and retention. So we've got Amanda Marquez. I hope I've said that right, Amanda. And you we've do, also got Thanks. And Damian Wilkins. Good evening, both of you. Evening. Hi. How are you? Knackered. Probably like most of the rest of the social care workforce, I think, in this country. I think we can sum it up in... Uh, in 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 that word but um but ever hopeful yes yeah i think we we all um we all need living hope don't we for a, i don't know what's happening i said to somebody today it was almost like everything was okay social care was kind of bobbing along yeah and we woke up the next day and it was like half the workforce across the whole of england just disappeared but in every single sector it's, i don't even know where people have disappeared to yeah it's um, it's certainly been. I mean, I keep saying this. I've been saying this since since COVID struck. We're in really extraordinary times. But what those extraordinary times look like and the impact of it is a constantly evolving and changing picture, um, and and very different from the first six months of last year to to where we are now. Um, I feel like we all know what we need to do, um, but because of current circumstances, we're so busy, people don't have the time to do all of those things. And I guess I would typify it, and, and Damien's gonna groan now, because I think I've said this in practically every conversation we've had in the last month, but everybody's door is wide open, right? Because we all need really great talent, but we're spending more money, we're spending more time and effort, and we're getting an ever diminishing return, while at the same time, all of our back doors are wide open too, and retention is becoming, well, it is an issue and it's becoming more and more of an issue. Um, I was really surprised yesterday when the, um, well, that been the day before yesterday, might even have been Friday, when the Skills for Care report came out with all of the data for, for the adult social care workforce. And I guess I understand that because of the impact of the first year of COVID, they're saying retention hasn't gotten worse. I'm seeing it a lot worse at this moment in time. And Damien, I think you'd agree with, we're seeing that across our clients. So well, it's probably right. I don't think it feels right, but I'd be interested in what you guys think. Yeah. Dawn, what do you think, putting you on the spot there? Yeah, definitely. I think retention is, is a massive, massive issue. And like you said, Amanda, with the back doors, we feel like sometimes we get two or three new starters in, they come in, they do their induction, they do really well. And that kind of then pivots in the other staff then thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go work here. I'm going to, I'm just going to go part time. I don't want to do nights anymore. I want, COVID's made me have this realisation that I don't want to do this job. I'm going to go to Amazon where I can get a £3,000 bonus. Yep for signing up yeah. so 
yeah, it kind of feels it kind of feels like this staggered approach all the time where you're taking two steps forward and three steps back yeah. because there's always somebody kind it just feels like sometimes there's always somebody waiting in the wings yeah. to to leave. Mm -hmm. So you may be getting on top of things and think you're you're nearly there, and then there's always somebody else that is ready to move on. Um, so I completely agree with that comment, and I think I sometimes massively I think okay, it's not the recruitment issue, it is the retention issue, and then other days it can be yeah. <laughs> completely reversed. So it is a bit of a minefield at the moment. I don't know how Adam feels because I know with his outbreak and things like that, it was a huge struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's so difficult because once upon a day, it's been so easy to go, oh, it's money, oh, it's money, we need to pay them more and that's that. Well, do not get me wrong, I think care workers should be paid a minimum of £12 an hour, period. I think that should yeah. be across the board, I think that should be across the sector. However, I advertise for a receptionist and I advertise for a person to work in my care home, providing support. I advertise them at the same wage, I get no, uh, no applicants for my care job and I get 30 for reception. So there's something that is putting people off from the sector. When we get to retention, to compare it to how we were pre-pandemic, I think is almost unfair because we now have more long-term health conditions that we need to consider as well. You know, we've got long COVID, we've got people who are afraid to come in because they're clinically extremely vulnerable. We've got a lot more burnout going on. So I think the entire situation is drastically different. And I think we were talking to Lucy Buxton at um, the care show and she brought up a great point as well. A lot of people who work in care, I won't quote them as I don't know, are women of menopausal age. And we have currently got people who are going through the menopause, who I believe is absolutely horrendous, working in extreme conditions, covered in PPE, fighting off viruses and long-term conditions as well. So it's I, I can't see it being one simple fix. I can't see it being one thing that's that's breaking the, the the workforce but to compare it to pre-pandemic times i i think is unfair um and i do think retention is a lot harder now job satisfaction has gone because we just spend our time running around cleaning keeping people safe and you know we were talking about the kickstart campaign in one of the, the social care groups coming in and they were suggesting that these people from kickstart could come and do the hand holding and making the brews and playing the games and i was like well, that's the part of the job we love you know we love to spend that time with people so if you take that away from the caring role we'll never employ we'll never recruit those are my adam, thoughts i, I yeah. would agree adam and you know th there's a couple of things going on there we've definitely got an image problem and um we need to do a better job in comparison to other sectors. I'm not saying that's easy. And equally, there is no one thing that any of us could tell anyone to do that's going to fix the problem. It's about different strategies, different routes to market. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, the average age of a frontline worker in the UK is, I think it's it's a white 47 year old woman. It's it's me. Um, and you're right. We're all premenopausal, and so. It's about doing a whole range of things in, in our experience at Cohesion. It's about thinking about how can you bring new people into the organization. Um, Gen Z or 24 and under is less than 10% of the workforce. And, and when we were chatting earlier, I keep asking people, what did you do for a Saturday job when you were younger? I've yet to come across someone that said, I worked in a care home or I worked in a social care service. You know. If I could ask everyone to do one thing, I don't know how many listeners we've got, go out and recruit that traditional Saturday staff person of both genders, because we're also 82% women and only 80 and only 18% men. So right there, there's something we can do. And it makes no sense whatsoever when you think about it, that if you talk to young people at further education colleges all around the country, Every college in the country has a health and social care course. And most of the young people, because we've surveyed them in the past and asked them, top of the list is I want to work with children. Well, that doesn't come without personal care. Um, followed swiftly by I want to be a nurse. That certainly involves an awful lot of personal care. So there's, it's all tied up in that image. Yeah, I think some of the image problems, like we spoke about Amazon. Like I use TikTok. I know Adam's on it. Dawn's on it. 
there's so many people on there like doing deliveries and you know shouting about how amazing amazon is but we don't have that with social care i mean even i was saying to somebody earlier even i watch those videos and i think by jesus it looks great fun to work at amazon like in the warehouse and gonna drive and then they work out the cost and yeah so even for me it looks great and i, I work in social care i definitely think there's an image problem yeah. Come back. And can we oh, just, sorry just just on that amazon thing just to try and because I'm, I'm all about myth busting and things like that yeah. you see it you see them making the pizzas and the fancy ice creams and they're all like having a really good time they are actually paid to open up a social media account and shout about them so when you're saying that about an amazon driver then i was literally behind an amazon driver the other day who curbed it running from three different houses to get back into his car because he must have had a van full of stuff yeah. it had his kid in the car with him so we could work it's not a glamorous i'm not you know go and work for amazon if you want to go and allow jeff to go back up into space again because that's what he does with your money but you know it's not that glamorous job that we see on tiktok and i think the problem with social care is we're too honest we're too honest to go nothing goes wrong and everything's fancy and everything's wonderful because it's not we have enough times and we need to be honest and i think we don't want to compromise that about ourselves but we do need to sing more yeah. Sorry, I, Mark. No, 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 you're okay. I've contacted somebody from TikTok about how much they actually earn. So he's going to send me a breakdown of what he's paid, how many drops and that. So then I thought we can compare it. And I think we'd have to compare it against home care because that's the most yeah. like for like. But yeah, as soon as I've got that, it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in in the comments. So we've had a question around how can you retain a good workforce when their mental health is suffering and they are close to burnout? which is from um, Carl here. So, Damien, what do you think to this? I'll bring you in. Um, it's, it's a real tough question to answer, if I'm honest with you. you. know, If people are at that point and at that breaking point, then they're going to start looking for escape routes, aren't they? But um, one of the big things that we, you know, we, we recently did a presentation on, I think it was 3,500 exit and retention interviews that, that we'd, we'd done on behalf of other organisations. And the general feel, whether that's somebody brand new in your organisation or they've been there for years, is the fact that they want to feel individual they want they want managers to treat them as an individual and make them feel special which they should and with the current state managers are that busy and not in every instance they're that busy to to, to keep up with the day-to-day -day tasks that they're not managing to spend this very valuable time that the workforces are crying out for now you know we, we were talking about compounding issues earlier that affect retention you know we've, we've, we've got the having to have a vaccination which is putting a lot of people off we've got the exit of, of our european workers which is just compounding the existing staff to work harder, longer, be more dedicated, be more committed. And I think if we go pre-pandemic, a lot of workers were already at that point, and we've, we've, we've squoze them and squoze them and squoze them. You know, at what point do we actually reset ourselves and go, hang on a minute, team, do we, do we gonna, we're gonna get you a bit involved? We're gonna ask you for your help and your support and get your ideas talking about bringing in Saturday workers to give them some relief, mm. um, talking about maybe changing routes, flexibility, we hear that all the time, don't we, Amanda, that people are screaming out for flexibility. And routers are routers. You can't just change them because somebody wants different working hours. But if we can, again, attract people that maybe want three or four hours a week to take to take a part of a shift that gives somebody some time back, then these are the things that we really need to start doing. Now, there are some fantastic organisations doing these things. But, you know, do we take time every day or do we have the time every day to go and spend time with our valuable staff members and make them feel as valued as they should be? Yeah. I Touching on rotors, there is one bugbear of mine. So when I was 17 and I started, I never knew what I was doing on the Monday and it was Friday, Saturday. And I remember <laughs> hating, you could never make a plan with your family or your friends. Yeah. And I always, I think it's slightly different in home care. It's a lot harder to do. But in a care home, there's no reason why people are on set rotors while they can't have their rotors mm -hmm. a lot further in advance. Mm -hmm. I know the care home I was managing during COVID, when I left, bearing in mind that was seven, eight months ago, they had their rotor up until February next year. So they had their yeah. Christmas routers already, so they could yeah. plan their work. And I was always about work-life balance with the staff. But mm -hmm. I, we, st we see it on the care and view side, we see it on the, on the care and support worker groups, that people still don't know what they're doing one week to another yeah. next. And I just, for me, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's outrageous. We speak, to, um, we speak to a lot of people, obviously, in that interview stage where we're trying to book in interviews, and people can't give you the availability because they don't know what's happening next week. Mm -hmm. Now, just that element alone, not to know what you're doing next week, the work-life balance is already gone. There's no claiming it back. It's literally, I'm just committed to my job. And that's a great place to be. But, you know, we know what the world wants. It wants a work-life balance. And if we can't offer that, someone's mm. going to try and find their escape route out of that organisation. It's as simple as that. Mm. So, Damien, oh, sorry. 
I was just going to add to that in, in terms of specifically mental health and people people getting to a point of crisis. Um, we're seeing more and more providers offering up to six hours of um, professional support for their staff. And I'm sitting here racking my brain trying to think who Royal Star and Garter for sure are doing that. And they are seeing lower turnover. You know, they're kind of kicking those trends. Um, but, you know, most of the other things Damien's talking about, the spot on flexibility, time with managers, better rotors, and it's almost counterintuitive because of the situation we're in, because we're short staffed, because retention is high, it actually makes it harder to do a lot of those things. So, you know, it, it's I wouldn't want to manage the rotor. Um, I love the idea of having it so far in advance, though, Mark, but um, I wouldn't want to be the one that's organising it. Yeah, I think if you're on a rolling rotor, it's so easy yeah. to do though, because mine yeah. was a two week rolling. So you just had to print them and then add, add in the annual leave yeah. and people, you know, yeah. they could swap if they wanted as long as, you know, the shifts were, were covered. But And I think touching on the mental health support, the care workers charity offers some mental health yeah. grants and also self referral services. So if there's anybody watching that need that for their teams, that's definitely a great resource to look into. And something I learned recently is the NHS website has a raft of mindfulness and well-being apps and services you can you can utilise. Um, things from just having a bit of a meditation and, and a guided meditation app to full-blown tech support and in, in mental health chats over over the phone. So you know there is there are, there are those resources out there. I just don't think we're the best in this country at signposting people to them. I think we've got them. But we don't inform people enough. If we still had the care app, which got disbanded in March the, this year because the government thought COVID was over, then carers would have it in their pocket at their hand and would be able to just access it. But we don't. So maybe we need to do more as a, as a sector to, to support people in how to access and where to find it and not to be ashamed to ask. Yeah, that's just Sorry, Damien, I cut you off. No, it's all right. I think there's a, um, you know, in, in care work, whether the word's banded around, like we use it a lot because it's the values of recruitment, but resilience in workers is a huge thing that, you know, we look for resilience in care staff. It's the same as saying how many hours you work a week. Like I work 40 hours a week, I'm going to push it to 50, then 60. That come, becomes a breaking point. It's the same with, with, with resilience. We can only push people so far before that resilience hits a point and then you're almost at the point of no return. So we need to learn and develop tools to gauge people's resilience and when they've got to that point where we think they're okay because they got through another day there could be a breaking point so i think that's another awareness point for the future yeah no definitely and i think while we're talking about resilience and bits and pieces you've got an event coming up haven't you around bank staff which i think is one way to help help staff absolutely and i guess just touching on that point of flexibility if you've got somebody who is at that breaking point and you don't want them to leave, you can actually reduce their contracted hours. And then when they feel comfortable, bring them back in as, as a bank worker. And, you know, I guess, you know, we, we talk a lot about parity with the NHS. We've got the same government department. We've got the same funding streams now, right? Um, but we, we approach the use, the provision, the management of bank staff very differently. Um, and we, we, we also talked about money, and I, and I know there was some some comments in the, in the chat about that using bank staff effectively. And in fact, I did some 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 sums on it. So if you have um, a, an agency worker on ten pounds an hour and a twenty percent margin to the recruitment agency, which isn't unreasonable, they've got to earn a living too, and there are lots of good ones out there. And um, with WPP National Insurance Working Time Directive and then 20% VAT, the difference between a bank worker and an agency worker is £5.60 something. And over the course of the year, 20 agency workers working full time against 20 bank workers working full time. And I know that's not, a, it's just a way of, of using um, a comparison. It's over £220,000 in savings. So then why don't we look at it differently? You know, why don't we approach agency staff to move to bank contracts and offer them flexible working? Part of the reason why we don't is because agency workers will really struggle to go from weekly timesheets to being paid monthly. And not every provider offers weekly bank payments. So there's there's a whole host of things there that I think we can just look at differently. You know, could you offer an enhanced rate? So I'm in danger of stealing all my thunder for Thursday morning, but um, 
we are hosting the event and if anybody would like to join us i might just cut it cut it there there we go can i just interject on this point yes yeah, sure. and i'm not saying i'm not saying it's a wrong point and maybe i don't know enough but no. i would want to say to providers if you are paying, because on average it's 15, 16 pound an hour in the Northwest where we are for an agency worker. If you're willing to pay that week in, week out, uh, with no end in sight, so you're, you know, unwittingly, subconsciously accounting for that now in your budget. If you're willing to pay that, calculate how much that is on top of your normal wage bill and just give everyone else a pay rise instead. Instead of paying that 15 pound an hour, to a yeah. random agency, yeah. just increase your staff's wages. Exactly, exactly. I think one of the big things that we see, and we, we see this a lot in, in large organisations that are you know, ahead of the times, if you like, that the recruitment solutions are facing one direction of the business, and the temp solutions is a complete reactive response to when that doesn't work. And there's no correlation between an action plan of, if we reduce this and we can, we can work more towards the, the perm side of recruitment and work better with our existing workforce, it, it makes it's common sense, but you know, you tend to find it's finance people looking after temp and HR people looking after perm recruitments. So when true. people start to go, let's let's work at it facing each other, they can go, hang on a minute, simple solution like what you said there, Adam, which should be common sense, but yeah. two different departments have obviously very different views. And I think that's a, a huge awakening for a lot of organizations to go, hang on a minute, let's have a let's have a brainstorm together rather than, you know, the opposite effect. It's also a great opportunity to bring underrepresented groups into the sector. So, you know, soapbox moment, climbing up on it, uh, all of those students. I, we often get told, well, you know, teenagers can't deliver personal care. Not true. Uh, all, all of those things, you know, if you look at the demographics of the area in which you operate, um, you might be operating in an area with a really old demographic where people are retired offer them the flexibility, you know, engage with them, talk to them regularly, that people that, that want to come in and make human connections and work in the community, but work in a flexible way. You could say the same about students, you could say the same about all sorts of different parts of society. I'm, I'm conscious, so there's, um, I always plug Paul Rainbow at Hearts County Council because he is amazing and, he told me that in, in one morning during COVID, he was helping the screening. So he normally runs their early talent program. And uh, he screened um, an ex-cruise ship captain, a Tony and Guy stylist, and um, a riverboat traveler, all of which ended up working through the pandemic on flexible contracts in, in the HCC homes. And I just love that as an anecdote, as well as lots of allied health professionals and those people will have made a connection. COVID's over now. They might only want to do a shift a week. You know, the riverboat traveller might want to go off and come and do one week every three months. Why would we not want to keep those people where they have a connection to a home or a service? Uh, you know, again, it comes back to the F word. You know, every time flexibility is, you know, up there in the one of the top things that we try to encourage at every turn. I suppose with flexibility, it's a bit like this whole golden handshake because, you know, we'll sit there and we'll go to people, is two, three hundred pounds for joining us and everything like that. But then you'll get the rest of the team going, what about me? What you know, is it just a brand new customers only sort of offer this? Mm -hmm. And we've had it in, in the past and we've learned from this mistake of where we've had people who are on bank and they'll go, I'll work that, I'll work that, won't work that, won't work that, I'll work that. And then my team will come and go, and this is, you know, back when I was young and, and unafraid and like lame is in my head. <laughs> but, you know, back when you were young and still learning and then your team would go and go, well, I can't do that. Can I do that? Can I do that? Can I do that? And be like, no, I'm doing your rotor and that's that. So we can't have flexibility for one and not for everyone else. So I think if we're going to be doing stuff for bank and agency, there needs to be cross workforce parity in our, in our homes and we need to offer it to everyone. And then everyone will be happy. Otherwise, we might as well just staff our homes with everyone that's on bank. But no, I completely agree. Flexibility is a huge thing at the minute. And it's something that we're slowly learning as a sector. You know, starting at nine o'clock, going home at three so they can go and pick the kids up and then coming back. You know, it's it's something we're learning. There's a lot of work to do on it, though. Yeah, very much so. I think that brings Dawn, us sorry, I'm gonna ask, I just want to ask Dawn because um, I don't have kids. And um, I know Mark does have kids, but Dawn's got like a football team. Um, <laughs> so, 
<sighs> what? What's your experience with flexibility? Because obviously you've worked in social care. We um, summarized the other the other week. It's twenty five years or so now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you cope with uh, school runs and and poorly kids and everything like that going through it? And do you think times have changed any at all? See, see, I was never offered flexibility because mm-hmm. this was the shift pattern. If you went for an interview and you went for a role this was what you worked and this was the shift pattern and it was alternate weekends and it was working Christmas and it was working bank holidays and if you got children this was your decision and I was talking to somebody today that I was interviewing and I was going to bring it up in a minute that said to me today obviously I can turn up but if my kids get Covid or if they're in a class where there's an outbreak, I'm not going to be able to come in. Mm. So this was already worrying this applicant that mm. I was interviewing before she had even got anywhere because she had th- um, two in primary school and one in high school. Mm. So as, as they're, they're, we can offer the flexibility, but they're already worried about how flexible as an employer, I've already got to be before I've even offered them a job yeah. because it feels like they're jumping on it quickly. Well, I've got children and if there's an outbreak, then I've got all three of them at home and I can't get to work. And I think it's that kind of worry for applicants now as well. It's not just about thinking about, OK, so I'll have to work a 12 hour shift or I'll have to do this. Now it, there, there's so much more going on in the background. Um, another lady I spoke to um, yesterday, if they have an outbreak, he has to stay there. Mm. She then has no one to look after her children. Oh. So I think that the world has changed so much that as much as everybody wants to be flexible, this, like I said, there's so much going mm-hmm. on in the background that hinders people from mm. being that flexible as yeah. much as we want. But yeah, no, I was given no flexibility for a long time. I was told when my rotor was and I was told when I was working and if I needed it swapped, I did it myself. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's a shame really, because I would argue that that's probably still the case in a lot of places around the country and that that flexibility doesn't really exist as much as we try and say it does. I very much doubt it does. I mean, the awesome managers around, like like Dawn, who will always put the the, the, the team and the, and the family and the people they support first. But and I'm not saying that other managers don't do that. I think we're just afraid that we won't cover the care. Mm. So then it's who, where, where do you, your responsibilities lie? It's a very fine line because you don't want to upset relatives and you don't want to upset your team members and you really don't want to upset the people you're supporting. Very difficult, very difficult. Um, I, I would oh. agree, Adam, that there's not that. I mean, I think there's more, but it's not across the board. And and actually, guys, you only need to look at Indeed and put in health and social care, care and support worker. And what you will see on about 70% of the jobs is this is the pay rate. You will work any day of the week. It's seven hours a day. You will work these shifts. Most of them don't talk about flexibility. I think flexibility is now critical and important and managers and leaders are talking about the need of it. It's being bandied about as a solution. But actually, if you look at the, there are very few providers that actually say on their websites and in their ads, we want the right people come and talk to us about what works for you where you you do not see that on job boards so so yeah i i would tend to agree and i and dawn i I don't mean this in in a um i'm gonna just say it anyway was it easier 25 years ago because now everyone's working and actually the value of the salary has been so eroded is it you know what was it what's your sense for somebody now where we haven't really been able to increase care workers wages in line with inflation. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day who's quite senior in a a dom care organization and he was earning what we're paying care and support workers in the kind of mid nineties when when we were able to pay that because the funding stream was uh, a lot fatter. So did that make it easier? I mean, I know it's never easy juggling family and work. 
Yeah, I don't, it made it easier to an extent, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it was I with my income. I'll be honest, was always regarded as their second income because it yeah. wasn't as high as my husband's. So mine was kind of the second income type, pocket money type, right. kids' clothes and trips mm -hmm. and things like that income. So that's where that I used to become frustrated. Mm -hmm because I'd work a 40 hour week and not earn the same. Yeah. Um, but there was always that kind of separation in respect of incomes for a long time. It's not until I've moved and continued with my career that my income has then changed. But no, definitely right. It's, it's kind of sat at a level for a very, very long time and it's not really changed. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people do regard it, especially the mums and things like that, they do regard it as a yeah. second income yeah. rather than the main income of the household. So as far, like I, I agree with Adam, every care worker to me should be on 12, 13, 14, 15 pound an hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish that could be possible. Yeah, even higher. Yeah. But we've sat at this level for mm -hmm. so long Sometimes I wonder whether this is ever, ever, ever going to change because th there's always that association with the rate of pay. Mm. C community Integrated Care launched Unfair to Care back in July. Uh, and, and I'm sure you guys have seen it. You know, you you're, you live and breathe this every day and you're, you're in it. And, and I think that they didn't they say it's £7,000 just for parity. You know, yeah, which, for the NHS. Yes, it's, but just it was, with the NHS. It's utterly mm -hmm. ridiculous. I mean, we're 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 dealing with clients now where there are both uh, well, where there are numbers of staff who aren't don't want to have their sec have their vaccinations, and they're saying, "Well, I'll go and work for the NHS down the road, and I'll get an eight grand pay rise." How do you cope? And with it's that? not just the pay rise, though. It's it's pensions. Yeah. It's sick pay. Yeah. It's triple time on a Sunday. It's enhanced rates when they're absolutely on their asses, if you will. We can't compete with that. You know, our team do extra and then they go, but Adam, I'm going to get absolutely hammered by the tax man. So what's the point in doing extra hours if I'm not going to do it? Now, I've started to tout the idea and we've always done time off in lieu for those who want it. Yeah. But we can't offer full paid sick pay. We can't afford to. We don't have those funds that come in. But I'm at that point now where if people are going to be taking all those extra routers, mm -hmm. then why not say it pay me for this much, put the rest in time off in lieu, and then if you're sick, you've got something you can draw upon. You know, if you're you know, you need a bit of extra time off, you've got something you can draw upon. Yes, I know you've worked it and I know you've earned it, but it's gonna stop you from going over any tax thresholds that you might not want to go over. And it's also gonna support you when you're not expecting it. You know, oh, you know, um, such and such has got COVID and now I've got long COVID, I need to stay off for an extra week. It's fine, though, because I've got that built up that yeah. I can use. I mean, I'm really happy you brought up Indeed, because I think it's at the point now where we're all just playing hungry hippos and trying to get, you know, everyone's just trying to get those carers. And, and Indeed doesn't work, in my opinion. I think it's an archaic job board. I think it's going the way that the, the job gateway did, you know, the original job center plus job board. You've created something new, is it, that I hear? Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes. So we created Care and Support Jobs, um, which is free to use, free to post, free to share content. And we're working hard to develop it uh, from, from a candidate perspective. Um, but... The idea being that, you know, not every candidate's successful. People might just want to find out about the industry and not necessarily just a, a particular company uh, and also learn about how they can, what what are the career pathways in care? What does a day in the life of look like? What can they expect in different care settings? What types of different care settings exist? Um, and what, what how are they different to each other? So all of that information um, and you're right, in, indeed, is, is frankly, is the bane of our lives for a lot of the time, you know, and I'm not even going to go into it because we need another more than an hour. Um, but if you're direct sourcing um, passive candidates, whether it's on Indeed or somewhere else, it's really good to have somewhere to send them to learn about the sector. So that kind of laying out your stall. Um, we also like to signpost candidates there. And um, when they've been unsuccessful to help them for next time. And also 
let them see and search for jobs that that might be in the area and um, so for anybody who who wants to um to get in touch with jamie and or me tomorrow we can get you set up in uh, in no time at all and, and you can be posting your jobs on there um thank you what a great plug adam <laughs> yeah, i think it's a great point to add as well that you know we know that social care doesn't get the the best end of, of all the deals that go on in, in the economy and we don't get all the funding and then a time comes along when we're short on staff and people just start spending not small amounts thousands of pounds mm -hmm. per month on more indeed adverts which is the same as everybody else is doing so it doesn't get you to you know it doesn't get you from three to two it gets you from three to the same three for more money we have a few customers of ours that you know we love working with great customers that have gone Do you know what let's put this into our staff they're up in the pay rates and they're getting more attraction they're not positioning the adverts any better it's the price point and yeah, yeah there's a point of time when that maybe they can't keep sustaining that but for now to go hey instead of spending more money on making people look at the same advert why don't we make the advert a bit more attractive that's certainly something we're seeing a bit more of a trend in recently and mm -hmm. seeing the results as well yeah. and do you not think we wait too long to recruit because we always go oh we're fine we're ticking along we've got enough to cover holidays and sickness and everything's fine and then you know one person gets a job off uh, someone goes off long-term sick and someone else leaves you're like oh no i need to recruit <laughs> Should we be constantly recruiting? Should we always have our options open and should we always be recruiting for people? What are your thoughts? Well, I wouldn't say always be recruiting. I would say always be engaging. Um, so things like Care Home Open Week. Um, I'm, I'm an ambassador for championing social care and um, we promote Care Home Open Week in the summer. And, you know, it, it's not so much about constantly interviewing, but open your service up to the community around you. Think about how you can um, engage with schools, with colleges, um, with, with church clubs, with whatever's going on in your area. What events can you run? What can you involve people in? Um, I volunteer at um, a care home not, not that far from where I live, and they, they have a coffee shop that you can go to if you're visiting a relative, but equally they run events. They do jewellery nights. I mean, they do all sorts of things. It's brilliant. And it's somewhere to pop on a Saturday and, and during Care Home Open Week, there are loads of great events. And those those people that you engage with will then know what it's like. You know, you're demystifying it. If you said to a, a, a group of people, you know, who do you think earns more, a care home manager or a bank manager? They'd go bank manager every time and they wouldn't be right. You know, and those are the kind of you know, those are the kind of messages that, that we need to get out there. Um, that being said, I would suggest, you know, if you're recruiting at scale, you should be getting at least 10 percent of your hires from a talent pool if it's well managed. You know, that that's what we would see across the board on our clients. So, you know, you interview and oh gosh, do you know what? I would love if we had three great people for every job at the moment. We're not seeing that. Um, but sometimes you have people that don't quite get a role and maybe there's only one role in that location talk to them about what that means, put them in your talent pool and engage with them. You know, people want to hear the positive stories and, and, and messages and they want to know what's going on. And then next time you are recruiting, you've got someone that's already warm and interested. Yeah, and to add to that as well, and this is, a, you know, I'm really passionate about this is, people see care as that minimum wage entry level yeah. job and forget about all the career mm -hmm. progression possibilities yeah. that you can't just go from one industry to another you know nearly every manager that i speak to is born and bred mm -hmm. into the industry and have some fantastic success stories and again the points there absolutely spot on amanda what is the opportunity in career people mm -hmm. probably couldn't give you any anywhere close with specific answer yeah. but in other industries they can because they can see that and there are some fantastic progression opportunities some fantastic mm -hmm. careers yeah. and you know you see people being like regional managers and so on and so forth on yeah. large salaries and i don't think anyone else realizes yeah. it unless you you know you're caught up in that industry itself so yeah we definitely need to work together to share it out a lot more although you know what and and it is great to share those stories of people that progress up through the ranks but it's okay to not want to too. So um, care, yes. through the millennium, care, care Through the Millennium are um, a Midlands-based organisation. And um, again, I like to cite them because I, I think it's really great to share best practice. They recruit every year about half a dozen teenagers, much like Paul Rainbow does at Hearts County Council. They take people on at 16 and yes, they deliver personal care. I froze then in a really bad way. Um, so... They, they do hire people and um, we spoke to to one of their apprentices, Abby, and she loves her job, 
She joined at 16. She was sticky because she was an apprentice, so she had training and development. Abby didn't want to be a manager. She thought maybe in the future she might want to be a deputy, but she didn't want to come away from delivering frontline care. She also, you know, what, what do people think? Where, where do we have problems recruiting? We have problems recruiting for night shifts and weekends. When we talked to Abby, Abby said, I can't wait to be a bit older because at the moment I can't work a Saturday night. And I know that's not the true face of care. And that came out of the mouth of somebody who'd barely turned 17. I think sometimes we're in danger of not giving young people credit um, for being responsible members of society. And there are plenty of that generation who have positively opted in. And, uh, you know, it's always good to be controversial when you're on a chat show. I would go so far as to say, and I'd be interested in your views, um, you guys, but I think sometimes there is a bias towards young people. Discuss. Go on, Adam. I'm gonna like go on and mark. Well, I don't. I, I would always go. Oh, do you know what? They're yeah. they're lazy. They always phone in sick. They're gonna go out. They're gonna get a hangover. They won't come in. And um, they're gonna be pursuing other things. They'll always be at college. Where's the flexibility for them when they are learning and wanting to work at the same time? And yet, they are not. They are. They've just been children. They've just been in a position where they've been constantly cared for. So they've been nurtured and grown and, you know, popped out into society. And they're going, actually, I'm so close to remembering what it was like to be nurtured and cared for. But I really want to give this back now. And I think we're at such a good point in society where the younger generations are more self-aware. They are more aware with our surroundings, our environment, you know, with animal cruelty and elder abuse and bullying and... Um, everything basically i know pierce morgan would sit here and call our generation woke well do you know what if it means being a decent person i'll take woke yeah i've been yeah. called worse in my life um but i would completely advocate for, for for younger people to come into the sector because they are some of the most caring people i've ever met ever ever met and they're interested in equality think about who they're influenced by they're influenced by malala and greta thunberg you know the more than any other generation they're online saying this isn't fair this isn't equitable um, and my last thing on it because someone showed me this when i grow up i want to be a carer by jenny ma have you seen this yeah. how cool is this Having it, decided, yeah. i don't even know what to do with it but i kind of feel like if everyone bought 10 copies and dropped them off in junior schools around where they were i i, I don't know there, there's something there isn't there so, I'm currently trying to get together a social care book list, which is going to cover different areas of the social care spectrum. So, for managers needing self-help, for managers wanting to improve tactics, for carers wanting to learn more about themselves, for people who are in care, for people who receive yeah. care. And we've also got a children's book list going on as well. And Jenny Max, a close friend of all of ours. Um, and it's a fantastic book. We completely... I've not got my copy with me right now. But it's just like scream about it get it into the schools you know yep. we tried to get marcus rashford on it marcus i know you won't be watching but if someone knows marcus and he is watching <laughs> you've got to be a professional footballer now to make change so come on marcus help us let's get these books in there um yeah oh no all for that book i mean dawn you love the book don't you i do love it and there's so many lovely books coming out and just on the point of teenagers yeah my teenage son worked in a care home <laughs> from when he was 14, 15. Yeah. So it's, and there was always younger, younger people yeah. employed in, in the sector. And it doesn't necessarily have to be caring. My son worked in the kitchen all through mm -hmm. the pandemic, worked really, really hard three days a week, worked around sixth form, worked around college. Mm -hmm. And the only reason he left was because he went to university and, and needed more hours because they yeah. couldn't give them to him at the time, more flexibility mm -hmm. because they couldn't give it to him. So there, there are those there are those individuals and those teenagers and people mm -hmm. that are interested yeah. in this sector. They just need pushing that little bit more. And unfortunately mm -hmm. for my teenage son at the time, he had me as a mother that was pushing him in the door. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot, a lot of teenagers that are interested, but like I've said before, it's not pushed by the high schools. It's not pushed necessarily just in general that 
people can make a career or a focused career from mm -hmm. it. And he he does say he, there's something he can always go back to yep. because he's already got those skills. He's already yep. done that mandatory training. And he has an understanding about equality and diversity and health and safety mm -hmm. in a care home and moving and handling. He's aware of all those things. So to hear me, he's kind of picked up skills forever because he'll always be yep. able to mould back. And if you, if you look at the stats of um, the number of people that care at home that are unpaid carers and unrecognised mm -hmm. carers that are under the age of 18 and 17 that have been giving care for, for, for years to their own family members, we suddenly think they're incom incompetent because they haven't been doing it as a career, but they've been in a home with no resource, no support, no training, mm -hmm. they definitely have transferable skills without a doubt. Yeah. I think um, we're running this... Oh, sorry, Mark. Oh, no, sorry. I was just going to say, I think we think of 16, 17-year-olds as... Like when I was 16, 17, where yeah. you're out every night drinking, where a 16, 17 year old these <laughs> days can't. Yeah, they don't. Like they're so they're so different, aren't they, than, than yeah. what they were years ago. So and I, I think I, I always remember I think they get a hard time as they climb up the career ladder as well. And I remember mm -hmm. I was managing a care home when I was 20, but the amount mm -hmm. of pushback I got from like the older staff in their 40s, yeah. 50s, and I, I still get it now. I've been, mm -hmm. you know, when I when I started in my last previous job, it was you old enough to be, a, you know, a regional manager. And I, I'd always say to them, and I say it now, I say, you can have that opinion, but let's put that in the diary for six months' time. And I make sure mm -hmm. I put it in the diary for six months' time. And I'm like, we'll come back and you can ask me the same question in six months' mm -hmm. time once I've proved myself to you. Yeah. And actually, let's have that conversation. So I think it's as well, you know, if you've got the younger staff, is actually mm -hmm. providing them with that mm -hmm. actual honest feedback that actually... Mm -hmm. If you climb that career ladder really quickly, and like Damien said, you can climb it and you can spread into different avenues within social mm -hmm. care, then actually you might get that pushback from older staff mm -hmm. that actually this yeah. is how you can deal with it. Right. I like to think that care is a meritocracy and the UK is a meritocracy. And have I have worked in, a, in America and, and my experience was that it is more of a meritocracy here. Um, but again, just, just coming back to that point, you know, if, if you went to an FE college, if if you went to a traditional um, milk round, um, you wouldn't see any care providers there. It's like no no social care business has a head office function. You know, all, all we do is look after people and, you know, people forget about the vast range of opportunities that are available. Um, Dawn, what does your um, son want to do after university? What's he studying? He's studying electrical engineering. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So he's in his first year. Yeah. Well, I say in his first yeah. year, although he's he's completed Freshers Week. Yeah. Oh, so nice. that is an achievement. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that is an achievement that he's still alive yeah. and he's yeah. still has student finance left. So um, yeah, he's so he's he's kind of getting into it. But yeah, he's training mm -hmm. to be an electrical engineer. Yeah. But I think. He, 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 he was earning money. He was mm -hmm. he was working at around six form at the time. It was a really good mm -hmm. thing for him, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he's doing really well. And like you say, he says now I can go back to it if I want. I can mm -hmm. go back to it and go back in the kitchen or do other bits and pieces. And he learns so management. It facilities yeah. management you know yeah. look, looking after the sites looking after the estates for larger providers i mean everything that happens in other organizations has to happen in social care we forget that yeah or well, we don't the rest of the no. world does sometimes <laughs> we don't so i've got one more question and then i was thinking damien i want to ask you your top three tips on recognizing burnout and and being overworked and what we need to look within ourselves and how we can recognise it. And Amanda, um, just top three recruitment tips from yourself. Um, but Mark, you might be able to answer this for us. I don't know whether our guests can tonight. I know I can't. How do we recruit when the pay is so low? When we have no funds and we have no money and the pay is so low, how do we recruit? What do we do? You're on mute. <laughs> now, <laughs> I was saying, I, I have this conversation a lot with managers, and I don't think the pay is the be-all and end-all. And I think I look back to kind of some of the care homes I've managed, and, you know, shamelessly to say that they, they have run on minimum wage, but actually we never had a recruitment issue. And I think it's the way you treat staff. So I think, like we spoke about flexibility, it was always that. I always knew I never... I was, I do now, but I never had a work-life balance, but I was always keen and I always made sure that every single one of my staff, if they wanted it, had a good work-life balance. 
And I think it's it's how you reward staff. And it doesn't have to be financial. I think just saying thank you goes a long way. And I always used to do personalized thank you cards or letters. Mm -hmm. And I'd always make sure that I said it to them, but I'd follow it up in the post because then actually their husband or their children saw it. And actually if they're away from the care home or the home care service for a long period of time, actually that card then stood on their table or their mantelpiece or something. And I think then subconsciously in my mind, I always just think, well, maybe the husband doesn't mind actually, because actually they generally are appreciative of all the work they've done. I think, like Amanda said, there are staff that don't want to, you know, progress, which is absolutely fine, but actually still, you know, give them that training and development. And actually they might want to not might not want to learn any skills relating to social care, but actually can you give them skills outside? So is it computer skills? I know in the past we've helped people, you know, with driving lessons and bits and pieces like that, but actually just rewarding them. And a shameless plug for my last column on with Log My Care, I did one around morale and motivation. I think we spend so much time looking at recruitment and recruitment, but we forget the staff that we've already got and then they end up leaving. We think, well, why have they left? But actually it's because we've focused so much on the front door and the new staff mm -hmm. coming in that we forget them. But yeah, that's my five pennies worth. Okay, so we've only got, we're a little bit over actually. Am I still on mute? No, I'm not. I thought I was doing a marketing. <laughs> um, so we are running a little bit over, but I really do want to hear um the the you know you're on because you are the experts for us and i really want to know so top tips for recognizing burnout and for being overworked and what, what what were the top three things you'd say for people to look in uh, at themselves or their team there's an old saying that i think goes in not just for care for, for many people is you know when your most passionate people go quiet that's a huge sign that they're they're feeling disenfranchised and you know what more can i do to change this and it doesn't mean they're necessarily right but the, the passion is definitely there and when that disappears that's a huge uh, red flag for me. Yeah. Um, I know it's kind of the same question, but it's also passion, isn't it? It's you know being vocal is one thing, but when you see that passion, that that ten percent of magic that people deliver in any kind of job, when that disappears, you're like your heart's just starting to wilt away from it. And then we see this a lot at the moment. That extra commitment that we want off people, despite the I heard an amazing phrase um, an event a while ago that we asked you to walk the extra mile and you walked a million more, and it still makes my body tingle now that people did that. They went more than the extra mile. And now if you ask someone to go that extra mile, would, would they be prepared and committed to do it after how they feel? Do they feel any better for giving that extra mile? Probably not. So, you know, I think they're the three big signs for me that when they go quiet, they lose the passion and the commitment drops the, the yeah. more than foot out the door. Yeah, and they're quite obvious ones as well, aren't these? You know, we, we see it and we're probably, we're so used to seeing it now, we're probably desensitized from it and we just go, oh God, they're a bit low today and they're not really talking yeah. and we're not sitting there going, Oh, this should be a warning sign because they're usually really happy and jolly and and laughing and joking and you know. So yeah, no, great tips, great tips. So we'll make sure that we share those uh, after the show on social media. I'm going to give that job over to Mark. Um, so <laughs> Amanda, uh, top three tips for recruitment for providers in this current market. What do you do? It's really hard at the moment, and we've talked a lot about flexibility. I can't not say flexibility, but very practically at each stage in the process. So care is 24 seven. Are you offering interview slots out of hours? Are you offering interviews on a Saturday? You know, can you, how can you accommodate that? Are you putting it in your ads? You're yeah, happy to chat to anyone that wants to kind of talk in more detail about that and how we deliver that. So definitely that again, because of the current environment, early talent, go and recruit. I don't think I'm allowed to say Saturday girls and boys go and recruit young people to come into your service or home and develop your own pipeline of talent for the future. It's not going to turn things around overnight. It will alleviate some of the issues now. And it will also start to win hearts and minds. As you mentioned, Mark, those those people that didn't believe in you, because how could they you didn't have enough wrinkles? You know, actually, they'll start to see that young people are amazing. And thirdly, look at underrepresented groups. There are you know, there are vast numbers of people in this country that have disabilities of all different kinds. How can we help them into into employment? How can you accommodate them? Um, there are loads of jobs that people can do and actually they find it really difficult. So getting in touch with you know, people like that, that are running restart programs or the Shore Trust or the Prince's Trust and you know, there's all sorts of organisations out there. They will require more pastoral care in some cases if it's somebody that maybe was a care leaver, maybe had substance misuse issues, perhaps they've been in jail, but it doesn't mean they don't have a right to um, 
quality of life and, and a job that makes them feel great at the end of the day and sometimes doesn't make them feel great at the end of the day. They have that right. And again, you know, a bit of legwork required there, but in the absence of things changing enormously, um, you know, those are the types of things that are going to unlock some of the recruitment challenges we're seeing now, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, great tips. And in fact, your, the, your number one tip is something that we don't take into account because I had a bit of a Barney with my bank recently because I was like, you shut it free. You're only open Monday to Friday. I work nine till five. I cannot come down and see you. Where is the flexibility? And then, you know, someone will go, oh, can you do an interview on a Sunday? No, I don't work Sundays. But it's exactly the same situation. If they work nine till five and they need an interview, then they can't. Great idea. Yeah, out of hours, late evenings, do it on a Saturday morning or on a Sunday afternoon. Brilliant tips, Amanda. I love them. Some providers do it. Some providers do do it. Not many, but some do. Adam, you need to um, change your bank into the Metro because they're open seven days a week. <laughs> a, a shameless plug for Metro. Um, I think the other, the other tip that I have, which I still think for care workers we do not need, is the CV. I think so many people no, are like, not CV. Yeah. Like, what is the point? I don't see the point of a CV these no. days. And people that say, oh, they must have care... They don't, you don't need care experience. No. I think some of the best care no. workers are those that don't have experience yeah. at all. Absolutely. So I'm going to have to just add to that. You're absolutely right, Mark. And I guess I'm, I'm thinking of the current challenges. Make it as easy as possible to apply. So when we work with the clients that we work with, we always say, OK, why on earth would somebody who's on their phone or a tablet, which most people are nowadays, who want to work for you, the minute they get to the bit where it says, give us your whole work history and don't miss a day. We, you haven't even interviewed them yet. Tell us who your references are when we haven't offered you a job. Mm -hmm. well, you don't need it yet. Ask for the information you need at the stage in the recruitment process that you need it. Because yeah, I go on shopping websites and the minute I have to fill something in, I click off because I can't be bothered. And that's what, well, that's what happens. We're all too busy and we are all swamped with requests for information and we ask for a ridiculous amount of information that we do not need for people who are just registering their interest it's it it, it doesn't make any sense does it and just to add to your point there mark as well we speak with lots of customers and i have in in previous roles where the new the new to care people as we call them that have no experience are hand over fish rated yeah. as the best workers they've got on site yeah. because they've nurtured them, they've nurtured mm -hmm. them, they've moulded them. And yeah, by far, if anyone's worried about taking on new workers, mm -hmm. I'd certainly give it a try and yeah. get the real experience for yourself. Don't listen to the horror stories because there's very few and far between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And CQC yeah. have something to answer for for this gaps in employment because providers are made to feel pressured into yeah. getting it in, safer recruitment, safer recruitment. You need to know where they've been every minute of their life. You need to know what they've done. Well, actually, I've just looked at DBX, and they've not battered anyone, and they're not at risk to people, and they're not on the uh, adults barred list. So why do I need to know where they were in February 1974? You know, I don't know where I was last Tuesday. I definitely don't know where I was last Wednesday night. So why do we need to do that? And CQC need to adapt. They need to evolve and change. Yeah. Oh, we could talk about this all night. Sorry. Yes. The CQC have a lot to answer for, don't they? Yeah. But unfortunately, no. they will not come on our show. So oh. if anybody's watching from the CQC, you can come on. Like It's literally just a free-flowing chat show. But yeah, every, every request, they tell us that it's not in their priority at the moment. So yeah. what can we do? Oh, I can't believe the time. The hour has flown by. Adam, you're on mute again. <laughs> I was just going, I know, I was like, I was like, I, I, I tentatively, well, I'm not tentatively, I have booked the cinema for quarter past nine tonight, which I'm, you know, I'm usually tucked up in bed with a cocoa or something. They're like, no, let's go to the cinema, it's really exciting, there'll be plenty of time. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at the time, we could talk all evening. So I, I just want to say a huge thank you. I know this has benefited me uh, going into my new role with these new wonderful ideas. I honestly love the idea of out of hours recruitment. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing that people need to consider. Um, and I think we've learned a wealth of knowledge tonight. I know Dawn um, and, and, and Mark really, because you're both still in direct roles where you're managing people who recruit or are recruiting yourself. So have you found this beneficial tonight? Oh no, tonight's been amazing. I've, I'm taking home, I'm taking in lots and lots of things and I'll probably be contacting you both at some point over the next couple of days. It's been really good. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. Thank you all. 
Can I, I, I've just got one thing. I want to go back to the theme that you started with of fruit because something popped into my head for you, Mark, to try, your peel eater. So apparently if you're having trouble sleeping, boil a banana and drink the water. It puts it knocks you right out. I mean, I, I will try it. I don't have any problems. One for you to try. Yeah. There we go. I thought it was on the wrong show at the beginning when it was talking about <laughs> some fruit without peel on, so... <laughs> oh, but we thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting us. We really Thank enjoyed you very it. much. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Adam, are you going to close us out tonight? I can do. So uh, next week we is our Halloween-themed episode. We may be dressed up, we may not. Depends on how things are going. Um, so we just want to have a bit of fun next week. You know, we want these poems coming in. We want you to have fun with your, the people you're supporting. It's been a really nice sort of time. I know not everyone celebrates Halloween, but everyone's entitled to the one, you know, one good scare. The care sector is entitled to one long decade long scare, um, and we're still in it, and it's still frightening. But in our homes, in our services, let's have a bit of fun. Let's have a bit of joy. Get these two hundred word poems. Two hundred words, you know, the limit. It's not a target. You can do them at five lines long. It's not an issue. Send them over to us at the Care Room View and we will read them out. We'll we'll pick our top three favourites and then we'll share all of these poems over social media. It's just a bit of fun. Let's get everybody involved. Um, and because we're having a bit of a fun week, we've got Jenny Mack, author of When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a Carer, joining us um, to discuss activities and her joy and love for activities. Um, and it's really just going to be a sort of insightful, what can we do to have a bit of fun uh, this this spooky season um, and we'll do something similar coming up to Christmas so as usual Tuesday is 19.30 nearly said 9.30 then Dawn don't want to scare him up uh, 7.30 on Tuesday on YouTube exclusive follow us on Twitter follow us on Facebook um, and you'll be updated when our new uh, episodes are live so thank you so much everybody for joining us don't disappear we want to say goodbye before we go um, but for everyone else good night See you later. Bye. Thank you again for joining us tonight on The Care View. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And whilst you're here, check out some of the other videos that we've got up online. If you've got something that you think may be interesting for us to discuss, or if you want to guest spot with us, then drop us an email to thecaringview at gmail.com. Come. Follow us on Twitter, find us on Facebook, all the information is down there in the description box, but until then, 